Star Wars 7x7 episode 1892. Today, it's a news and notes roundup episode where we cover some Star Wars The Rise of Skywalker stories that by themselves were not enough to merit a whole episode of the show. Punch it! Hey Rebel Rouser, I'm Alan Voivod and this is Star Wars 7x7. Thank you so much for joining me for this episode. It's a potpourri episode, if you will. And yet I'm not sure how many folks understand the notion of potpourri, so calling it a news and notes roundup seems like it gets the point across a little bit more clearly, but it's a potpourri episode. That's how I'm looking at it. Same difference anyway, all sorts of little stories that don't add up to a whole episode each on their own, but together, well, here we go. So... First off, earlier this week I talked about looking at you know the Rise of Skywalker D23 footage and how I had miraculously learned to advance frame by frame. Well, there's something else that popped up in the frame by frame advance. And that has to do with the original teaser, actually, that was released back in April. So Tying that to the footage that was released in August via D23, you'll recall how we saw that fleet of Star Destroyers in you know, a huge line in dark space and lit up by lightning and whatnot. Well, if you go frame by frame quickly through the April Skywalker teaser and you see that moment where there is apparently an A-Wing on fire and spiraling by a Star Destroyer, you can go frame by frame and look and you can see at the top of that con tower on the Star Destroyer is the little X-shaped structure that is specific to old school Star Destroyers. It is not a First Order Star Destroyer that's pictured in that Rise of Skywalker teaser from April. It is in fact the older model that was then shown to us in the D23 footage. Now, speaking of Star Destroyers, not too long ago, there was an announcement by Fantasy Flight Games that does a lot of Star Wars tabletop gaming, for example. Uh, there was an announcement about an Onager class Star Destroyer expansion pack, and it included a design for a different kind of Star Destroyer, something that had been referred to as the Siege Breaker in The Rebel Files by Daniel Wallace. And there was a note in this in-universe book that suggested perhaps the First Order might have used this for inspiration or some of the technology from it for their own weapons. Well, its capabilities were very similar, at least as described, to what we saw from the Dreadnought in The Last Jedi. And I got to wondering about this after the D23 footage because, of course, we see a giant laser coming down to a planet and destroying a large section of something, but we don't know where that's coming from. And based on the artwork that I found on Wikipedia about this, it looks like the bombardment that it's capable of unleashing is definitely more like the Dreadnought from The Last Jedi, where it is discrete cannon fire and not necessarily a sustained blast, but that, of course, doesn't necessarily mean that it's not also possible for something like that. And, come to think of it, that blast is probably not altogether dissimilar from what we saw in the siege cannon that was brought onto crate and used to crack the door of the rebel base there, or the resistance base, like an eggshell. That being said, I suppose we should point out the fact that there was the battle cruiser revealed in The Force Awakens, aka the First Order Star Destroyer, and then the Dreadnought was revealed in The Last Jedi, and so... You know, even though it seems to have been integrated into what we already know, there's certainly the possibility that they will introduce a new kind of Star Destroyer or similar capital ship-like weapon for the First Order in The Rise of Skywalker. I mean, you know, it would seem to go along with the way things have developed. And so that's your Star Destroyer news for this week. Also, something that I did not mention to you when we were talking about the Black Diamond business earlier this week there is, I guess, a literal interpretation, if you will, for something like this, too. In Legends, there were such things as dual-phase lightsabers. And what the deal was with a dual-phase lightsaber was that it could rapidly and quickly extend to more than twice its normal length 
and usually that involved the addition of some other crystal or gemstone, like a diamond, for example. Corin Horn, who was part of, I believe, the X-Wing series of novels, he had one of these, and also at some point, Darth Tyrannus, aka Count Dooku, and Darth Vader even deployed dual-phase lightsabers on their own. Again, this is all legend stuff, but, you know, they do go back to the well sometimes for stuff like this, and so... The notion of adding a black diamond into a lightsaber for a bit of a surprise, well, yeah, that could also make people go a little bit nuts if they saw that. Like, what? And seeing as how we were talking about uncommon lightsabers in regard to, you know, Dark Ray and her dual-bladed lightsaber that folds open and whatnot, I thought, eh, let's at least mention it. But I don't think that it, something like that is probably not worth naming a production company, Carbonado Industries, over the fact of, or the potential for adding a diamond into a lightsaber. It doesn't seem likely, so just be that as it may. There's one other bit of news that I wanted to share, and it has to do with comments from John Williams, and I'll share that with you after the break. Stay tuned. This episode is brought to you by Constant Contact, the premier email marketing solution for small businesses and organizations. I've used their service since 2003, and over the past decade and a half, I've watched them evolve, make the product simpler, more powerful, easy to use, and do everything that they can to help train people to use the product more effectively and for it to work with other forms of marketing like social media, for example. So. Check out sw7x7.com slash email to learn more about Constant Contact and start a free trial. Once again, that is sw7x7.com slash email for a free trial. Welcome back. So John Williams talked about the rise of Skywalker. He, of course, is in the middle of scoring the movie right now. And he is not going to spoil the ending for us. Of course, he would not. But he does think that we are all going to love it, which... You know, I don't think he would say anything else, but, <laughs> you know, it's not like I don't believe him either. I mean, this is a gentleman who has seen them all, and if he says he thinks we're going to love it, well, I'm inclined to believe him. He also says in regard to Poe Dameron, and it's rather surprising, you know, of all people and things that he decides to call out, that he mentions Poe Dameron and he says that he thinks we're all going to be surprised about Poe's character that he doesn't have a total squeaky clean flyboy reputation, that he has something of an ambiguous past. And we do know that his character has something to do with Zori Bliss, the character played by Carrie Russell in The Rise of Skywalker, and that character is, of course, a bit of a rogue, a scoundrel, so to speak. So the fact that Poe has some sort of involvement in his past with a scoundrel like Zori Bliss, well, it does open up some interesting possibilities, to be sure. And it's probably going to turn out to be a good thing that Poe has some friends in low places to borrow from the Garth Brooks song. But, you know, when I think of people with a more ambiguous past, you know, it sort of puts me in mind of Han Solo pretty quickly. I mean, I would say that his past you could easily define as ambiguous before he got involved with the Rebel Alliance and ultimately became one of the you know most important good guys for the whole Galactic Civil War. So, yeah, just because Poe has this ambiguous past, you know, it doesn't necessarily speak badly about him, at least until we find out just what it was that he was doing. But for now, at least, it adds a little bit more depth and complexity potential for his character, and that is never a bad thing. And that is going to do it for our wrap-up of news and notes about the rise of Skywalker that didn't necessarily warrant episodes for each one of them, but all together, here we go. <laughs> and that's going to do it for this episode as well. Thank you so much for joining me for it, as always, and may the Force be with you wherever in the world you may be. This podcast is not endorsed or sponsored yet by Lucasfilm Limited, Disney, or 20th Century Fox. It is intended for entertainment and information purposes only. Star Wars, the Star Wars logo, all names and pictures of Star Wars characters, vehicles, and any other related Star Wars items are registered trademarks and or copyrights of Lucasfilm Limited or their respective trademark and copyright holders. May the Force be with them. All original content is copyright 2019 by Star Wars 7x7. We hope you love it.